on World News Tonight. Pakistan struggle. The government of Pakistan calls in the military to tackle the growing outrage from amongst Imran Khan supporters. Trump strikes back. Donald Trump lashes out at all his opponents in the controversial CNN's town hall interview, with Republicans from New Hampshire cheering him on. A potential end? Egypt plays the middleman between Israel and Palestine and Israel intensifies rocket attacks in retaliation to Hamas strikes towards the south. A puppy prom. Pampered poachers parade in elaborate costumes in San Diego's infamous canine prom. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News, bringing to you news from across the globe. Now tonight we dive into the latest updates on the tense situation in Pakistan. Pakistan's government called in the army to help end deadly unrest in the wake of the arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Before this, the military was already deployed in regional uh, areas, but not to an extent to a national level. Pakistan's government deployed the army on Wednesday to stop violent protests that have broken out across the country and left a number of people dead since the arrest of former leader Imran Khan. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif on Wednesday warned protesters the government's response to the unrest would be, quote, iron-handed. At least five people are dead in violent clashes between protesters and police, dealing a blow to Pakistan's stability while it suffers a severe economic crisis and faces a delay to an international monetary fund bailout that's lasted since November. Khan's supporters stormed government buildings following the former prime minister's arrest in a land fraud case on Tuesday. Other state buildings and assets have also been attacked and set on fire by protesters, escalating tensions between Khan and the army. As protests rage on, the former international cricket star turned politician is now under the custody of Pakistan's anti-graft body for eight days for further questioning, according to a government advisor. If convicted, Khan will be disqualified from standing for office, possibly for life. Pakistan is due for elections later this year. Now on to China. For many of China's manufacturers of baby and children's products, painful reverberations from last year's historic decline in the country's population are already upon them. Domestic sales are shrinking and the scramble is on to develop new streams of revenue. Push chairs, onesies and cuddly toys. Items in the baby aisle are facing declining sales in China as more people in the country forgo having children. China's population drop is forcing companies that make things for babies or children to diversify or seek buyers overseas. Yang Zhang is one of them. She's the founder and CEO of children's clothing company Nachna Kids, which is now making more clothes for grown-ups. We have a lot of parent-child outfits. For example, a piece of clothing which I would previously only have made for children, I will now ask my tailor to make an adult version. Right now, the sales volume of adult clothing is actually pretty large. This is how we're currently preparing for the declining birth rate. We have considered making pets' clothing as well, but our team is relatively small. Last year, China's population fell for the first time in six decades. And in April, India officially became the world's most populous country. The knock-on effects have been swift. China's market for baby food and diapers is the world's largest, but it's expected to contract this year for the first time since Euromonitor began keeping data in 2012. The research firm estimates that the market will shrink by 2% to $37.2 billion by 2025. Baby companies are going to face declining margins. Sean Rain is the managing director of China Market Research Group. For years, China has been the major growth driver for the world's largest baby care companies, whether it be infant formula or diapers or children's toys. What's happening is a lot of these multinational brands are starting to focus on India because India is still continuing to grow and has eclipsed China as the world's largest country in terms of population. Birth rate declines are not expected to end anytime soon, with analysts noting young Chinese adults are not keen to have more than one or even any kids. 
due to the sky-high costs of child-rearing. Israel hit Islamic Jihad targets in Gaza for a second day and Palestinian militants launched hundreds of rockets across the border, setting off sirens as far away as Tel Aviv, while Egypt began efforts to mediate an end to the fighting. Israel's air force hit Islamic Jihad targets in Gaza for a second day on Wednesday and Palestinian militants in the enclave began launching rockets across the border. Sirens sounded and people, including these beachgoers in Tel Aviv, were sent running for shelter. Esti Shabelis lives in Tel Aviv. The military said it was trying to hit rocket sites preemptively as blasts rocked different points, including what witnesses described as a training camp in the northern part of the Gaza Strip and an open area in the south. Several were killed, medical officials said. Their identities were not immediately clear. Minutes after the strike, sirens sounded in Israel, initially among border communities, but soon also in and around the commercial capital Tel Aviv, 37 miles north of Gaza. There was no immediate word of casualties in Israel. The local media reported that a home was hit in the town of Sterot. In Gaza, multiple contrails could be seen ascending as rockets were launched. Mid-air explosions signalled interceptions by Israel's Iron Dome aerial defence system. On Tuesday, Israel launched a series of strikes it said were aimed at senior leaders of Islamic Jihad, responsible for planning attacks against Israel. At least 10 civilians were killed in the strikes, as well as three senior commanders. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for Wednesday's rockets. Islamic Jihad had promised to retaliate for the strikes. Moving on to the FIS, President Yun suk yeol will hold a bilateral summit with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Seoul upon the 60th anniversary of their diplomatic relations. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is expected to travel to Asia next week for an official visit to South Korea and the G7 Leaders Summit in Japan. Trudeau is set to visit Seoul between May 16th and 18th and meet with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol to advance shared priorities including economic and energy security, the path to net zero emissions and human rights. It will be the Prime Minister's first official visit to the country, according to his office. The agenda focused on trade. While in South Korea, Trudeau is also expected to promote the Indo-Pacific strategy that the Canadian government released last fall. The strategy aims to advance ties in the region and promises nearly $2.3 billion in new spending over five years, including for trade and military projects intended to counterbalance a rising China. Following the visit to South Korea, Trudeau is slated to attend the G7 summit taking place in Hiroshima, Japan, from May 19 to 21st. The Prime Minister's office says that his priorities at the meeting will include collaborating with G7 partners to support Ukraine and advance the transition to cleaner economy. Former United States President Donald Trump's appearance on CNN's town hall was the first time in years that he faced prolonged questioning from a news outlet outside the friendly confines of conservative media. Trump's participation in the public forum came as he turned his focus to potential 2024 general election rematch with Democrat Joe Biden. CNN hosted a town hall with 2024 Republican presidential candidate and former U.S. President Donald Trump. Over the course of the night, Trump took questions from New Hampshire Republicans and undeclared voters who plan to vote in the 2024 GOP presidential primary about a wide range of issues. Trump made claims about the 2020 election, violence on January 6, 2021, the economy and his handling of records after leaving the White House. His 70-minute onstage in New Hampshire served as a vivid reminder that the former president has only one speed and that his second act mirrors his first. He is, as ever, a celebrity performance artist and even out of office, remains the center of gravity in American politics. Trump was so focused on discussing and defending himself that he barely touched on President Biden's record, which people close to Trump want him to focus on. But he was disciplined when it came to his chief expected primary rival. Donald Trump defended January 6 as a beautiful day. He hailed the overturning of Roe vs Wade as a great victory. He wouldn't say if he hoped Ukraine would win the war against Russia. He talked again about how the rich and famous get their way. Women let you, he said. 
and he refused to rule out reimposing one of the most incendiary and divisive policies of his term in office, purposefully separating families at the border. Trump's answers played well in the hall but could all find their way into democratic messaging in the next 18 months. Trump predicted that Democrats could cave in the current negotiations, but insisted that default could be preferable to a result that doesn't stop the government spending money like drunken sailors. The U.S. hit the debt ceiling set by Congress in January that forced the Treasury Department to begin taking so-called extraordinary measures to keep the government paying its bills. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen recently warned that the U.S. could default on its obligations as soon as June 1st if Congress doesn't address the debt limit. Trump said that he could return to one of the harshest immigration enforcement policies imposed by his administration, separating migrant families at the U.S.-Mexico border. The zero-tolerance policy encapsulated the lengths Trump's administration was willing to go to deter migrants from coming to the United States, and Trump said it remained a strong deterrent. Trump, who lost his 2020 re-election bid to Biden, still appears to be the de facto head of the Republican Party. Even his would-be primary rivals had mostly muted reactions to the Carroll jury's damning verdict. Trump appeared to chide CNN ahead of the town hall, suggesting in social media posts that the network booked him because they are rightfully desperate to get these fantastic ratings once again. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden piled pressure on Republican lawmakers to move quickly to raise the country's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling or risk throwing the U.S. economy into a recession that could kill thousands of jobs. U.S. President Joe Biden piled pressure on Republican lawmakers Wednesday to move quickly to raise the country's $31.4 trillion debt ceiling or risk throwing the U.S. economy into a recession that would kill thousands of jobs. Because if we default on our debt, the whole world is in trouble. This is a manufactured crisis. There's no question about America's ability to pay its bills. America is the strongest economy in the world, and we should be cutting spending and lowering the deficit without a needless crisis in a responsible way. The pressure comes as talks between the White House and congressional Republicans kicked off ahead of a possible June 1st default on American debt. The Democratic president said that Republicans' opening proposal for spending cuts was far too steep. It makes huge cuts in important programs for millions of working and middle-class Americans, programs they count on. According to estimates, the Republican bill would put 21 million people at risk of losing Medicaid, including 2.3 million people here in New York State and 78,000 people right here in Westchester County. It's devastating. It's not right. Republicans have vowed to support raising the debt ceiling only if Biden agrees to retroactive reductions in government spending. The president wants the debt ceiling lifted without spending cuts attached, but said he wants to negotiate the next budget. But some see reasons for optimism on a deal. The Biden administration has signaled an openness to certain proposals that might raise revenues and streamline spending. One area of agreement may be the Republicans' demand to claw back some unused COVID-19 relief funds. And the White House on Wednesday joined Republicans in calling on Congress to pass legislation that would help speed up clean energy and fossil fuel projects. Biden will meet Friday with the top Republican and Democratic leaders in the U.S. House and Senate. The death toll from flooding in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo crept higher as aid workers found more bodies amongst the muddy devastation and wounded residents succumbed to their injuries in their under-equipped local clinic. The floods in a remote mountainous area of South Kivu province ripped through the riverside villages of Nyamukubi and Bushushu five days ago, raising houses, destroying crops and killing more than 400 people. Hanging on to hope, this man is trying to find two family members. They disappeared last week when floods hit this area in DR Congo's South Kivu province. They lived in the wooden annex out front. 
but given that we haven't found them, we think they might be in my father's home. If we don't find them, we'll leave. We've been looking for them since Friday, and we haven't found them yet. It's a plight shared by countless other families. Over 5,000 people from two villages in the area are still missing. Aid workers have been appealing for help. We're looking for bodies with spades, with our hands. If we had vehicles, devices or equipment, that could help us to speed up the search efforts. It would be good. On Tuesday, federal, state and local officials visited the area. They laid wreaths on several fresh graves and distributed food, coffins and money to stricken families many of whom said it was too late. We would have liked for the coffins to arrive on time. We've already buried people like animals, up to three, five, ten, forty people in the same ditch. According to the UN, around 3,000 people lost their homes in the floods. Still in Africa, Tunisian authorities were investigating a shooting spree by a police officer that claimed five lives and sparked mass panic during a Jewish pilgrimage at Africa's oldest synagogue. Security forces threw a tight cordon around the site in Jerba Island as officials probed whether the shooting were a random killing spree or an anti-Semitic terrorist attack. It's at the heart of Jewish tradition in Tunisia. Located on the island of Jerba, the Griba Synagogue is one of the largest and oldest pilgrimage sites in Africa. From Europe, the United States and Israel, worshippers travel from over the world to take part in the annual journey. Tunisia is home to the second largest Jewish community in the Arab world after Morocco, but members of the faith have dwindled significantly in recent history. Only about 1,500 members of the faith live in the North African nation today, compared to over 100,000 in the 1950s. This due to economic hardships, but also owing to the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and geopolitical tensions that followed. The Griba Synagogue is often touted as a successful example of Jewish-Muslim coexistence, but their fraught relationship in the Middle East and beyond has in the past led to anti-Semitic violence. The most notorious attack being a suicide bombing by Al-Qaeda in 2002 that killed 21 people. The attack crippled Tunisia's tourism industry and resulted in the falling number of visiting worshippers in the years to come. But the Griba Synagogue still attracts thousands each year. According to organizers, more than 5,000 Jews participated in this year's pilgrimage, which resumed last year after two years of suspension during the pandemic. Now for updates on the world of AI. Following the craze for chatbots, Google AI chatbot Bard is now open to 180 countries, including India and Sri Lanka. It's now become all the more accessible and there's no wait list and the English is not the only language available. Following the craze for the AI chatbot ChatGPT, Google has released its new conversational AI service, Bard, and it is available in languages beyond English with both Korean and Japanese an option. On Wednesday, local time in California, Google removed their waitlist for Bard, which was previously only available in the United States and the United Kingdom, and opened up its use to over 180 countries. With more coming soon. And in addition to becoming available in more places, BARD is also becoming available in more languages. Beyond English, starting today, you'll be able to talk to BARD in Japanese and Korean. Google's chatbot BARD is powered by the company's Palm 2 large language model. During its annual Google I.O. developer conference on Wednesday, Google also announced that BARD is adding app integration to maximize its utility and collaborative potential. Google also announced that they are on track to support 40 more languages in the future, while noting that adding a language responsibly involves deep work to get things like quality and local nuances right. Google has also integrated Google Lens features directly into BARD. Users can upload a photo or image as a prompt for BARD. Using Google Lens, the chatbot will analyze the photo and draft a few creative captions, all within seconds. On top of these image-related features, Google is also expanding BARD's coding capabilities, as well as having plans to soon launch extensions, including Google's own apps and services like Maps, Sheets, Gmail and Docs, while working with third-party partners to bring their services into BARD.
Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Blackpink's Lisa has become the first K-pop solo artist to have an album reach 1 billion streams on Spotify. Guinness World Records confirmed that Lisa's single album La Lisa achieved the record 595 days after its release. Lisa is now the one and only K-pop solo singer with seven Guinness World Records. Indonesia President Joko Widodo, current chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, stated that his country was ready to talk to anyone, including the military junta, in order to push for the implementation of a peace plan as the crisis in military-ruled Myanmar continued to escalate. Authorities in eastern Switzerland ordered residents of the tiny village of Rains to evacuate because geology experts say a mass of 2 million cubic meters of alpine rock looming ahead could break loose and spill down in the coming weeks. Chinese state councillor and foreign minister Ching Gang met with his French counterpart Catherine Colonna in Paris. Xing Gang said China is willing to work with France to implement this consensus reached by President Xi Jinping and President Emmanuel Macron and accelerate exchanges and corporations in various fields. As the end of COVID-19 border restrictions known as Title 42 approaches, groups of migrants have been lining up in a temporary stacking area known as Camp Monument in Brownsville, Texas, and were being searched and processed by U.S. border agents. And that wraps up tonight's edition on World News. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we had tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we finally leave you with dog lovers who gathered in San Diego, California to enter their pooches into the annual puppy prom. Lots of pampered pets dressed in glamorous outfits and sparky costumes gathered to determine who was best dressed in the show. Stay safe and have a good night.